was that a passage or God's word may teach more than is in one passage, but never less. And I think that is a very, very important principle for you to remember. If you're reading a passage and God says something or gives a commandment, he'll never expect less than that. But in another passage, he may give more information than is in that passage. And I want to go back and make a point that I really did not make as well as I should have when we were talking about, you know, the two testaments and the different sections of the Bible. The Bible is not put together chronologically or by time. In fact, in the Old Testament, when you get to the end of Esther, you're to the end of the history of the Bible in the Old Testament. Then you have the books of poetry, but they fit in back in the earlier history that's given in the earlier section, and you have the prophets that lived back at that time. I have found it very helpful to me, and I didn't realize this for many years, to look at the Bible as though it's a library. You go into a library and you have a section of biographies and you have a section of fiction books and then you have the Dewey Decimal System used and you have books on all different kinds of subjects. And if you know what the subject is, you can look up uh, in the card catalog years ago on the computer now and find by going to that section of the library. That's the way the Bible is put together. And when I taught you, you remember law, history, poetry, major prophets and minor prophets, biographies, history, Paul's letters, general letters, and prophecy. That's, that's what that's about. That's the different types of books. So remember two words that begin with the letter T. The Bible is not put together by time it's put together by type, types of books. How many books of law? Five, history, 12, poetry, major prophets, five, minor prophets, biographies, four, history, one, Paul's epistles, 14, take half, general epistles, and how many books of prophecy? You see, you, you've just referred to 10 sections of the Bible. And if you'll stop and think about what those words say, then it'll help you to know where to go in the Bible if you want to study some specific point. Tonight, I want to, in the first lesson, talk about the importance of the Bible. And I want to give you four points on this that I hope you will remember. I believe that God's word is important in that it is and gives a complete and workable plan for the home. I know of no better marriage manual than this book. And if you look back for hundreds and thousands of years of history, you'll find that where there has been success, the families were based upon what God's word has to say. It's one of the reasons that I'm so concerned about some of the things that are happening in our time. The breakdown of the family, a redefinition given in many circles for what constitutes marriage. I suggest to you that there's never been a book written that gives a more complete and workable plan for the home than this book. In Genesis 2, God saw it was not good for man to be alone, and he made an help meet, not a help mate, but a help meet fitting the needs of Adam. He set up the principle there in Genesis 2 that a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. That had to be a principle that he was setting up for the human race because if he'd only been talking to Adam, he wouldn't have told him to leave his father and mother. He was setting up a principle that Jesus said in Matthew 19 has never changed. 
He said there that have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said for this cause, the cause being that he made them male and female, which indicates appetite for love and companionship. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and they shall be one flesh. There are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And then he was asked about Moses giving them the writing of divorcement. And he said, Moses suffered these things or God suffered it or allowed it through Moses. And then he said, from the beginning, it was not so. Which is saying from the beginning, it was that way that he had just described. A man leaving his father and mother and cleaving to his wife and there being one flesh. I don't care how much debate that there is that goes on about what constitutes marriage. I don't care how much different ideas are accepted in different levels of government. God's word still says what it says. And he gives us the complete and the workable plan for the home. We need to go beyond this idea and think a little bit further on this. This book also gives us what will work to help a man be a good husband and a good father. Look at those passages that talk about providing for one's own. The passages that talk about bringing your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and not provoking them to wrath or anger. Look at the passages like Ephesians 5 that tell a husband to love his wife as Jesus loved the church and to love his wife as he loves his own body. If every husband would practice what's in this book, think about the kind of husbands and fathers we would have. And this book tells the wife what her responsibilities are pointing out that they are to submit to one another, suggesting that in the general sense they are equal, but giving some restrictions and some specific responsibilities to guide the house and be a keeper at home. And that doesn't mean she's not going to be in any kind of endeavor such as business. And I would point to you that even the uh, virtuous woman in Proverbs 31 is described as a woman who was involved in business type activities, but doing it to help take care of her family and to see that her family had what it needed. But if you were to take the Bible and study everything that's said, even going back to those uh, suggestions in the book of Proverbs, which includes much about the husband and the father and the mother and the wife and the children and their relationships, and come down through the New Testament and read everything that's said about being a good father, being a good mother, being good parents, you could have a home that will work. Because this book gives a complete and workable plan for the family. I believe there are two things that could solve most of the problems we face in this nation as far as the family is concerned. And many times we hear these discussed when Afro-American families are being discussed, but I believe it applies in every case. And I might just point out to you that I grew up in a county in Middle Tennessee where we had practically nobody living except Caucasians. But we had people who had problems. We had people who lived low types of lives as compared to those who lived higher types of lives. And I think many of the problems that we identify as being problems between black and white are problems between good and evil. And the circumstances in which a person has grown up, no matter what their background, their nationality, or their race. But one of our biggest problems in this country, folks, is having so many homes without a father figure. And if we could get our men to accept their responsibility of leadership, not bosses, but leadership, in all of our families, 
we would not have many of the crimes being committed that are being committed because those young men and women in some instances, but especially young men, are out on the streets because they do not have a father figure in the family that's leading them in the right way. And I'll tell you another thing that I think would solve almost every problem that has to do with our families today. And I hadn't really thought of this in a deep way until just recently. If every woman, listen closely to me, if every woman in this nation would say, there will be no sexual activity until you agree to marriage and being a father, it would solve almost every problem that we have. Now you think about it. And isn't that what the Bible teaches? To avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and every woman have her own husband. You study back in the Old Testament times even, and there was marriage. Adam took a wife and then he knew her. And that word knew there is the word that's used to describe the intimate relationship that resulted in conception. Cain knew his wife and she conceived. If we would get back to God's plan and respect the decency of the human body and the sanctity of the marriage relationship that God set into existence in the beginning, we'd solve most of the problems that we have in the family. And I believe when we solve the problems in the family, we'll solve most of the problems that we have in the world. This book gives us a complete and workable plan for the home. In the second place, it gives us the best advice that I've ever found or heard of to have a stable government. I'm sure you share with me in being concerned about what's happening in this nation and what's happening to our government. But there are a few principles that are given in the Bible where we are to be subject to those who are in authority, Romans 13. We are to pay tribute to those that are in authority, which means we are to pay our taxes. And though I don't especially like taxes, and I believe in many instances they're unfair, I do believe that God teaches that we are to support the government. Jesus said, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God's. On one occasion, you remember he had Peter go out and get some money out of the mouth of a fish. Well, I wish we could do that today, don't you? To pay their taxes. But you read passages like Matthew 22, 21, Romans 13, 1 through 6. First Peter has something to say about this. Titus 3 and verse 1. And 1 Timothy 2 and verse 2, and you'll see those principles that we are to respect those that are in authority and we're to obey the laws of the land not only for wrath's sake, but also for conscience sake. And we are to support our government, even financially. I believe that uh, every indication is in a reasonable way. And that we are to realize that those who are in authority are ministers of God not through the church, but in a direct uh, line of authority from God to those that are leaders of nations and leaders at different levels. And I also believe if you will study the history of the development of this country and the constitution that is supposed to govern this country, that you will find that if you took every principle out of it, that is talked about in the Bible, you wouldn't have much left. The reason for that is the people who established this country, though they may not have been New Testament Christians, as you and I understand that, they were people who had a respect for God and for His Word and for the basic and decent principles that were in that. And I believe if we could get back to those basic principles dealing with human relationships and study what the Bible has to say about the way the government should be respected 
And one point I sort of left out as we passed there in 1 Timothy 2, we're told to pray for those that are in authority. And even though we may not agree with everything that's going on, and we may not like somebody that's the ruler or the leader, we need to respect what God says about it. And we need to pray. And I know this week in some of our prayers we've mentioned uh, something about our nation and that it will get back to the basic principles that are right. In the third place, I believe the Bible is important in that it gives us a true way to overcome undesirable traits of character. Now you make a list of those things that are not desirable, like anger, arrogance, an egotistical approach to life, wrath, not being willing to forgive, uh, using language that's out of place. You just make a list of all that you want to of all the undesirable traits of character that you think exist in some people today. And I believe you can take this book and find that God condemns every one of those but I also believe there's another very important point here that we need to understand. And that is that God's book, the Bible, teaches us that we have to attack the undesirable traits of character from the inside out instead of the outside in. I'm not for sure that we've made the progress that we could have made where we have problems in human relationships today in this nation by trying to force people to do things. If we would learn to teach and to work from the inside out, I think we could overcome these undesirable traits of character. As I've looked at all of the things that have happened in the last year that's brought about some of the marches, and there's nothing wrong with the right kind of a march, to try to get a point across, but the violence that's going along with that, I just sat there and thought, why doesn't somebody get out there and start promoting the idea of loving your neighbor and training your children in the right way and doing good to other people? Folks, if we could get those basic fundamental principles that are taught in the Bible of doing unto others as you'd have them do unto you, that golden rule of Matthew 7. Those fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5. And see those problems that are given in passages like Matthew 15, where he says that that which defiles the man comes out of the mouth, and that comes from the heart. And then he gives a list of those. And if we would start teaching people to love their neighbor and to love everybody, and that everybody should have the same right in the sight of God, and yet recognize the, the principles that God has given us where there is some discipline that needs to be used in a self-disciplined way and also in our families and in our relationships. I believe we could overcome some of these things. Some of the very problems that were here 50 years ago are still here. I think we'd have to admit that. And yet, there, look at all that's been done to try to force people. Let me give you an example. Would it not be better to teach me to get up and give my seat to someone on a bus or in a room than to force me to move and give it to somebody else. I believe we ought to be willing to put other people first. But you're not going to accomplish much if you try to force people to put others first. And so I suggest to you that this book is so important in that if we could ever get back to teaching the principles of decency and morality and uh, relationships and getting along with one another and putting others first before ourselves and teach that to where people are reacting from the inside out instead of from the outside in. Have you ever thought about that passage in Revelation 3.20? It's Jesus speaking. 
Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I believe that's the door of man's heart. Behold, I stand at the door and knock if. In other words, he says, I'm not going to force myself in. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, that's one door that doesn't have a knob on the outside. Just on the inside. But Jesus said, I'd like to come into your life. I'd like to come into your heart. But you've got to open the door. You've got to hear me and open the door and then I'll come in. And I think that principle could solve so many things if we would use it. And I want to bring it home a little closer than you may want it brought. It'd solve our problems in the church if we'd learn to use it. Too many times we try to force and run over people instead of taking time to teach and to help them to understand what is involved. And many times, in fact, all the times, if we had the right attitude, or there's a disagreement even in the church, if we will sit down and be like Christians, and you know all of us ought to be Christians, or at least lean in that direction. If we'd sit down and, and talk about these things, and you listen to me, and I listen to you, and we try to come to the truth, we could do that. But you start forcing people and say, it's going to be done this way, and I don't care what you think. I think even though I respect very highly the authority of elders in a local congregation, that they accomplish a lot more by leading and not by driving. When elders say, we made this decision, and whether you like it or not, we're going to do it, it's going to be hard to get people to follow. But when they listen to the people, and then they have the right and responsibility to make the final decision within the boundary of God's word, I understand that. But if they will do that in a way of leading and teaching, and especially if there's somebody who doesn't understand what's involved, take the time to teach and solve these problems from the inside out. I believe the Bible is important in doing that. And then I want to give you one more. We've said the Bible is important. It gives us a complete workable plan for the home. It gives us the only way to have a sure and stable government. And it'll help us to, uh, to solve our problems of undesirable traits and characteristics. And in the fourth place, I believe the Bible is so important because it describes to us the only way of salvation. It describes to us the only way that we can get to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. John 14, 6. He called that way straight and narrow in Matthew 7, 13. God did not send his son to this world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. And yet stop and think. If what is being suggested, even in our nation, in the name of being politically correct is true, there would have been no need for Jesus to die on the cross. If a man can be saved as a good moral man, he could have before Jesus came. If one could be saved by the Jewish system, he could have before Jesus came. If one could be saved in a world religion, he could have without Jesus coming. If one could be saved just by being generally religious, he could have done that. All of that was here before Jesus came. God sent his son, his only son, to this earth to become the savior, the only savior of the world. And if we could get back to the Bible and understand that, and get everybody that's interested in salvation to come together on the Bible and accept the Bible for what it is and let it be the guide, think about the impact that that could have. The Bible is important because it gives us the only way of salvation. And folks, at a time when we're doing such a good job emphasizing that to those on the outside, perhaps we need to emphasize it on the inside. I'm afraid in the church we're getting away from the word. And part of that I lay at the feet of preachers. 
I'm not as concerned about what preachers are preaching today in the church as I am what they are not preaching. Almost everywhere I go, I hear people say, if I'm talking about the family, we haven't heard a lesson on that in months. We talk about what's right in worship and somebody say, I haven't heard that discussed in years. We need those self-help sermons. We need sermons that help us to feel good about being Christians. But there's a difference in being able to feel good about being a Christian and just feeling good where we are. And we've got to get back to preaching God's word. Giving book, chapter, and verse so people can check it for themselves. And get back to the fundamental principles of what the church is. I believe the biggest problem we're facing in the Lord's church today is found with members in the church who do not understand the distinct nature of the New Testament church. And folks, when you once leave the guidelines of the Bible, there's no stopping place. Some will say today, well, I look at some of these religious groups and there have been some in the last few days who are coming out and, and accepting things that you thought they would never accept. But when you once leave the Bible as the standard, there is no stopping place. A little boy was in a math class and his teacher asked, if you had 10 sheep in a pen and one jumped out, how many would you have left? And he said, none. She said, son, let me ask you again. If you had 10 sheep in a pen and one jumped out, how many would you have left in the pen? He said, none. She said, you'd have nine. He said, teacher, you don't know sheep like I do. When one sheep jumps out, where do the other nine go? Right behind him. And when you once change, for example, in our worship, when you once go back to the time that a piano was brought in, name me something that could not be brought in by that same authority. When you once change God's message, there's no stopping place. And so I suggest to you the importance of the Bible has to do with the family, with the government, with traits of character, and with the only way of salvation.